Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Up next, we are thrilled to present our keynote address. It's an honor to welcome John McWhorter, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Ohio Health as our distinguished keynote speaker. Each year, we aim to feature a speaker who can bring fresh insights into key healthcare topics that resonate with all of us. John has prepared an impactful and dynamic lecture and we're excited to dive in. John McWhorter joined Ohio Health in July 2020 as Chief Operating Officer. In this executive role, he's charged with successfully executing the strategy for Ohio Health and assuring the organization is high performing. John has responsibility for hospitals, ambulatory care, nursing, shared service, customer satisfaction, partnerships, and lean strategy. His extensive operational experience and success in leading highly complex and matrixed environments are key to advancing the mission at Ohio Health. Prior to joining Ohio Health, John served as Chief Operating Officer for Baylor Scott and White Health in Dallas, Texas, a $10 billion integrated delivery system. John previously held leadership positions with St. Vincent Infirmary in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Methodist Hospitals of Dallas. He received a Bachelor of Science in Finance from Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, and both a Master of Healthcare Administration and Doctor of Science in Health Services from University of Alabama, Birmingham. He's involved in multiple faith and charitable mission ministries and currently serves on the Salvation Army Advisory Board. We also, he also completed a six-year term on the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education Board of Directors. This lecture is streaming live and immediately following, we will again have a live Q&A session where you can submit questions for John to address. We will answer as many questions as we can. Following the Q&A, please complete and submit the post-lecture evaluation form to receive your educational credit. John, welcome. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and uh, wanted to say to begin with, we, we certainly are uh, fans of your company and uh, look at the, the long, rich history, and I hope to mention that as we go along. You know, the, um, the uh, Air Res Med uh, digital system that we just looked at is just an example of innovation in your field. And I know you've been very innovative. Your history has been that you've been very innovative, but I want to encourage you today, and I hope that this presentation will do so to encourage us to do more in, in developing an innovative climate in the areas where we work. How do we do that? How do we look at our leadership skills and what leadership skills help us do that? So we're going to talk a little bit about innovation. So we start with a couple of questions. Does leadership, do you, uh, do, do you and I impact innovation? And if so, are we doing so in a positive or a negative way? Can leaders help develop an innovative culture? Clearly your history would suggest you have. What leadership style is best suited and least suited to enhance innovation or make it worse? We'll talk a little bit about those things as we go along. So first of all, I'm, I'm, as I've read more about you, you have a rich history, 75 years old in 2025, celebrate your birthday. You, uh, you, you know, brand yourself as a company that cares, a top workplace in Northeast Ohio. You've won numerous awards for excellence and a 13-time recipient of this Northeast Coast 99. So clearly you've been recognized by outside parties as an innovative and a, uh, and a company that keeps its word and keeps its promises. And that's a great place to start. But when we start with innovation, you know, we're trained in healthcare to look for problems, right? And we, we, are, um, we are sort of uh, brainwashed, if you will, to look for the things that are broken and fix them. There is nothing wrong with that, but innovation has to be a little bit more of a blue ocean or a blue sky, right? It has to, we have to start with a question and a mindset of a what if. What if uh, we could design a product that the patient would never have to go into the hospital for? What if we could provide content, medical content, solely on the basis of their iPhone. There are a lot of what ifs. And as we look through history, because history is a great teacher, what we find is that 
the what if question was answered in a multitude of ways by some very successful and not so successful companies. So we're going to talk about the Paris World Fair. Now, the World Fair, we don't really have World Fairs anymore, but in the 1800s and 1900s, there was always a World Fair that was in a different location, a little bit like the Olympics, if you will, to show off a different city, a different continent, different country. And the World Fair was designed to bring new innovation, new thoughts, new ideas uh, into a setting where people could travel by boat or steam, um, uh, rail, other things, and, and attend a World Fair. So in 1900, Paris was the uh, World Fair uh, host. And so uh, the French government decided that they wanted to highlight the idea of what would happen in the next hundred years. And so they incentivized artists to paint um, uh, ideas of what would the world look like in the world 2000. So I want you to think about this. 1900, there is no airplane. 1900, cars or steam cars, but we don't have a gasoline powered automobile or an electric automobile like we do now. We didn't have uh, phones. Electricity had just come into vogue and into the mainstream. We were still powering things through a steam engine. So think about what the world was like in 1900, because I think it will blow your mind as to when, when we unleash our minds and talk about what if we find that many positive things can happen. So the first thing they did, this is just an example. This is someone who designed what is in essence the first recreational vehicle, right? A moving uh, home that's on wheels. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Winnebago or the RV of our time. And again, this was a this is an idea from the early night from 1900. Second, this one was really mind blowing. These were students. Take, this is a, a picture of if you can look at if you can see it of a student grinding up books, digit, if you will, digitizing information and putting it into a vocabulary and an audio system so that students could hear it without reading it. This is the precursor of our digital platform of information. A mind blowing for the year 1900, if you think about it. And then the airport or the airplane, if you will, again, a depiction, this is before the Wright brothers had invented anything. And this is a depiction of an airport in France called an aerocab station. Now, what's interesting about these pictures, these visions is that infrastructure had to catch up with these in inventions over time, right? If you think about it, you wouldn't have built, you couldn't design an airport on a busy Paris street. You had to have miles and miles and thousands and thousands of acres so airplanes could land. So there had to be some infrastructure and some planning that had to go into it. But the very idea that someone was thinking about digitizing information or building an airport with planes could take off and fly in the year 1900 is really mind blowing. If we think about how our companies act today, fast forward to today, what we found from the Harvard Business Review is that companies have a shorter lifespan than we do. Most companies aren't around even 40 or 50 years. Companies are now, instead of 100-year-old companies, and you have a 75-year-old company, which is awesome, companies last, some of them, as few as 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And companies die at a younger age than their employees. And neither how big they are or how experienced they are guards against their demise. So why are they, why are they becoming immortal? And I believe that answer is because they're not changing at the same pace as the outside environment. Now, when we talk about creativity, we talk about innovation, what's the difference? Because we can all be creative, but an innovation is something that uh, really has value to a, to a group of consumers. It is something that people will, will purchase, will want, and will be an enduring product that will, be, um, will, will stand the test of time, at least for a number of years, as something that people really want. Creativity is is a great thing, but that's more like, um, uh, uh, you know, sitting down and doing a uh, brainstorming, if you will. So what's the best fuel to for our company and for our department? And by the way, if you're like most things in healthcare, we do a lot of stuff in teams. 
right? And so we have to be able to assemble, create, develop, empower teams. And so what's the best fuel for a team inside your company or a company to innovate appropriately? Well, it starts with vision, right? We have to have a vision of what we are going to become. And that vision sometimes can be quite lofty. It can be quite specific. So one of the questions to ask yourselves is, do we have an enduring vision? Is our vision clear? Is it clear to consumers? Is it clear to suppliers? Is it clear to me? Right? We have to ask ourselves those questions. But when we talk about vision, I'm going to give you an example of the vision that was uh, that happened uh, in the early 1900s that sort of drives home the point. Before I get there, though, we have to talk about our blind spots because we can have a vision of what our future is, but each of us have blind spots and we have to think about what are my blind spots? What am I missing? What am I assuming that might not be true? And what opportunities have I just ignored in our company that could be real valuable um, you know, products or services? Let's take an example of Xerox. That, by the way, is a copier in the 1960s and 70s. Look how large a copier was then. I mean, it was as large as a room, right? And that's what you had to have to make a copy. And Xerox was very good at copying, right? They also had uh, a research lab in New York called um, the National Research Park. And the Xerox Park was a, um, uh, if you will, was an innovation think tank. And that's where they, they innovated and made new products and new inventions. Well, it's hard to believe, but it is truly historic that at Xerox, the Xerox innovation team came up with the mouse. If you think about the old laptop computers we had, we had the mouse. Xerox invented the mouse, not Bill Gates, not Steve Jobs, not Apple, not Microsoft. Xerox invented the mouse and had patented it. Uh, Xerox also invented um, the graphic user interface. And both of those things they had in their in their, um, you know, inside of their company. They went to their leadership and said, hey, we've got these kind of cool things out here. What, what, what should we do with them? And top leadership said, we're a, we're a copy company. We sell Xerox copiers. We, we don't want to get into computers or any of that stuff. And as the story goes, less than 90 days later, after they invented these things, both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates found out about them. They both independently flew to New York, licensed the technology, and the rest is history. What do you think Xerox thinks about every day when it thinks about we could have been Microsoft and Apple together with Xerox? I wonder how big our market cap would be then. And then another example of blind spot would be Polaroid. If you're a, an old guy like me, you remember that there used to be Kodak Instamatic cameras and Polaroid cameras. And the Polaroid camera was cool because you could shoot this picture and it would spit out a, a, a picture that was dark and then it would develop before your eyes. Well, the CEO of Polaroid uh, in uh, sometime between 1995 and 2001 made this immortal statement, right? That will always, somebody will always want a physical picture. What he failed to realize was the digital age was coming about. Xerox went under. Kodak went under. Uh, as another example, they neither one of them saw the future. They had a blind spot about physical, physical lenses and pictures that people would want to hold in their hand rather than have it on their phone or have it electronically. Fujifilm on the right had a different, uh, a different assessment. Fuji said, our vision is not to be a camera company. Our vision is we are a chemicals company. Why did they say they were a chemicals company? Because we use a lot of chemicals to process film. And so they said, well, what are chemicals good for besides processing film? They said, well, we can get in the cosmetics business. So they started to make, be, they began to use their chemicals and to introduce and, and uh, make makeup, um, perfumes, colognes, those sorts of things. And today, Fuji is still a company that is publicly traded, successful, albeit smaller, and Kodak is out of business. So our ability to adapt, be agile, rethink, revision who we are is really an important uh, part of our attributes that we need to have. 
So again, uh, just I mentioned it already, but they became a $20 billion company and they're still there today. All right, so the other aspect of innovation that has to be there is assimilation. So it's not just having a vision, it's taking things inside our company that are maybe disparate parts and putting them together in a way so that we can de develop a compelling, attractive product for our consumers. So let's look at this issue of automobiles. So in the, from 1900 to 1910, there were a thousand automobile companies that started. Okay. By two, 1915, there were only about three or four left. And certainly Ford and General Motors became the two dominant car companies. I just listed the ones, the, the car companies on the left that started with the letter B during 1900 to 1908. And nobody's ever heard of them, right? I mean, there's no a Bay State car or Bar Harbor car or anything else in it today. What was the difference in vision between the companies on the left and Ford on the right? Well, the companies on the left believe that automobiles were only going to work for the wealthy. They felt like cars were expensive and the only people who could afford it were people who were wealthy. So they designed their car company around the rich and the wealthy. Henry Ford said, I want to develop a car for the masses. My vision is to for every household to be able to afford a car and to have a car, a, a car in their driveway. So in order to do that, he had to reduce the cost of producing a car. Well, what did he do? Well, this is where the assimilation process comes in. If you look on the left, it says slaughterhouse at the bottom. So in those days, in the early 1900s, there wasn't much refrigeration. So people went out every day or every other day and they bought meat from a butcher and they went home and he cooked it. So he was at the slaughterhouse one day, his butcher, and he became intrigued by the way the slaughterhouse it was like an assembly line and people did different tasks along the way. And he thought to himself, wait a minute, I can adapt that to my car company. I can have people putting on transmissions and people putting on tires and people putting on different parts. And then he had been, uh, he had gone to France and he had looked at the way the French incentivized their painters and they had a commission system where if you were a French painter and you produced I don't know, three paintings a month versus two paintings a month, you received more money if you produced more. And he thought, well, I can use that system on my assembly line and the people who do things faster, I can pay them more money and the productivity will be higher in my company. And then he said, well, I can't sell everything out of Dearborn, Michigan. How am I going to get cars to Nebraska and to Illinois and to all these different places? And Singer Sewing Machine was a company based out of Illinois at the time, I believe. And they had uh, a distributorship model where they s took their sewing machines and sent them to different parts of the U.S. And they gave these distributors commissions to sell the sewing machines in their local market. And so he said, I can do the same thing with cars. I can set up local car dealerships who sell cars. That is how Henry Ford was successful and designed what at one time was the best car company in the world. And so he used things that were working in different industries, assimilated them together and built a car for the masses. Apple did the same thing. Uh, if, you, uh, if you were in the workforce in the uh, early 90s, you may recall that Apple and Compaq for that matter, Compaq is probably a name you haven't heard in a long time, came up with a portable digital assistant. It was the precursor of our iPhones or our uh, Samsungs or anything else that we have. And it was the idea of taking the computer out of the office. Now, the problem was um, the technology, the innovation had to catch up with the infrastructure and the technology. Apple had something called the Newton. Some of you may be old enough to remember that. The problem with the Newton was it was too big. It was heavy. It had a very limited internet. It was very expensive. The battery was so bad you had to recharge it every 30 minutes and it had poor handwriting in, in recognition. And so it was kind of a flop. In fact, Steve Jobs canceled the project and did not restart it until he came back to the company in the early 2000s. But look what happened between 1993 and 2007. Corning came out with thermal gl uh, glass. A company called Fingerworks 
came out with the touchscreen technology that we use today in our cars and our phones and everything else. A UT research in, uh, arm, University of Texas research engine, came up with very good lithium batteries. Hitachi came up with a high resolution display, and I always give Al Gore credit for coming up with the World Wide Web. At least that's what he told me he did. And so we had all these things that came together at once. And so Steve Jobs and Apple were able to go to Corning and Fingerworks and Hitachi, license their products, put it together, and come up with the iPhone. And the rest is history. What we don't want to do as an industry, a company, or a team, we don't want to be Nokia designing the best flip phone in 2006 when Apple is coming out with the iPhone in 2007. And in a survey today of healthcare executives, most people think Apple is a very cutting edge technology uh, innovative company. Uh, Tim Cook, who's our CEO, says we say no to good ideas every day, and we even say no to great ideas in order to keep the amount of things we focus on very small in number. So it's not how many thousands of ideas you can generate. Can you focus on the best three or four in your company? So when we think of innovation opportunities, we have to think about how do we gather that innovation? And clearly, what the literature would tell us is the best way to gather innovation is to go survey our customers. Our customers will give us better insight than anything else. And in a study in the early 2000s, companies that directly captured their customer feedback had three times the growth in operating income and two times the return on assets than industry peers who captured customer insights directly. So the basis for our competition in healthcare, we have to be innovative. We have to have good quality, reliability of our products, but we also have to integrate customer experience in it. And that leads us to great brands. So think about it from where you are today. How well are we doing in, innovate, in being an innovative company? What score would you give us, give yourselves on a scale of one to 10? What about quality? Are we a highly reliable company? Do we do what we say we're going to do? Uh, or do we have a lot of defects? And what about that customer experience? How do we gather that feedback in a systematic way and look at it on a regular basis so we can say, wait a minute, there's three or four great ideas, or boy, we've heard the same thing from the consumer now seven times this month. Maybe we should do something about it. And so when you think about an innovation process, this is a very busy slide and I won't, we're not going to drain the slide for you today, but to think about how do you take an idea and put it through your process and your company and then come out with a proof of concept? How long does it take? Is Do you have a structured process? Do you have a formal process? Do you have a way to build a business plan inside the company that's not hard to do? Do you have people who help others build those business plans? Or do you have to go outside to do a business plan or come up with a great idea? You should ask those questions inside the company and small groups or others to try to figure that out. Now, when we think about being a leader, and I'm sure that most of you on this phone are leaders to some extent because, you know, people look up to you and they listen to you and, and um, you know, you, you are you're providing valuable service to the company. So what does the literature tell us about leadership skills and what type of leader is best at creating innovation? And the literature is overwhelming that a transformational leader or transformational leadership skills are positively related to innovation. What is a transformational leader? It's not Gandhi. It's not you know, John F. Kennedy. A transformational leader is simply someone who is optimistic about the future, they see the glass half full. They are constantly asking questions of the company. Why do we do it this way? What does a customer say? What can we do better? It's a, it's a question more than a directive. It's not being a directive leader. We have to be directive at times, of course, and purposeful, but it's about being inquisitive. It's about uh, having a vision, if you will, uh, of, being, um, of being a better place or a better company or a better team. And so the literature continues to tell us that transformational leadership style is the best one 
that's associated with improved performance and that a transformational leader can stimulate innovation. Those are, and not only in the U.S., this is worldwide and global also. And so what can we learn in 15 years of research about transformational leadership? Well, we also have to know that we have to empower our teams. Transformational leaders make people have energy or help people have energy for the future. They stimulate them. They, they, they uh, spark them to and, and are, encourage them and help them uh, think about the world in a different way. And uh, again, more more literature. Innovation is positively related to our the size of a company, their knowledge management. How well do organizations learn? Ask yourself this company. Ask yourself this question. How easy is it for my team or my company or my direct reports to learn things? Do we learn things well? Are we constantly on the lookout to be a learning organization? Do we want to? Do we have a thirst for knowledge? Or do we, are we happy with who we are? We just are fine with being successful and we don't have a hunger anymore. We don't have a drive. We just kind of go through the motions, right? Where are you on that scale of, of being a hungry, optimistic uh, company who wants to get better? Leaders not only promote innovation, but the literature also tells us that leaders encourage bottom-up innovation. So it's not just hey, what do we do when we sit around in the C-suite and think about something? It's how do I go in my business? How do I find out what that registered nurse who has been on the job six months thinks about what we can do better? How do I gather that person's feedback? How do I even have a conversation with them? I mean, Ohio Health has 28,000 employees. How in the world do we systematize getting you know, new ideas from new employees. How do we do that? And the way we do that is we have a, a, a lean uh, Gimba huddle model where we have Gimba walks and huddle boards and uh, sort of use the Toyota lean production system as our way to communicate up and down the organization. So each of our executives has an expectation that they will go into the field a couple of times a month and do a gimbal walk. And that means I'm in the, I'm in a room with, you know, 10 nurses in a department. They have a board. It's a dry erase board. They have their goals up there and the things that they're trying to improve upon. We get great insight in learning from our frontline employees, what they're doing. And then we take those ideas and we take the best ones back. And when we're all, all of management's around the table, we say, boy, I have, have a great idea at one of our hospitals that we should think about exploring and studying. How do you do that in your company? How does innovation bubble up from the bottom to the top? How do you structure it? How do you evaluate it? The problem in most of our companies is we have good ideas, but it's the challenge of having, are we, am I choosing the best idea or how do I choose from better to best? And that's a problem for us because we have lots of good things to work on. Leaders also support a dual process. They can orchestrate a dual process to manage in innovation. That is supporting our teams. So if we set up a team and say, we want you to design a new product, how do we support them? How do we give them the resources they need? How do we give them the time they need to think and ideate? How do we put different diverse teams together? Diversity is a very important part of encouraging our innovation. And then how do we manage the top goals of the company and innovate appropriately to, to achieve those goals. So what makes medical service company a great culture? But I think, uh, you know, and again, I picked this up from your website and some, some uh, looking at the literature, you're family owned. You have a great respect for patients. Well, if you respect patients, then I know you're probably thinking about what's the patient say we should do better. You have a great mission. We in the, in the healthcare field, the one thing we don't have to worry about is we're not a day trader trading, you know, stock options or uh, hedging, uh, working for a hedge fund that doesn't really have a purpose other than to make money. We have great missions. Our missions are to help people. We don't have to, we don't have to align our mission with people. Most of our people are drawn to our mission and they want to come help people or they wouldn't be in this field. So we have a great mission. We start with great purpose. That's not our issue. We care about what we do. 
uh, you seem to have leaders who care about what happens to your company, what happens to your patient, your, 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 your customers. And then teamwork. How well do you function as a team, both your small team and the bigger team? Great coworkers, I'll pull this from your annual report, great coworkers who always go above and beyond to support each other. That's a great statement. If that is something that you're able to do, that is an awesome advantage because not every company can say that. So if you have people that support each other, who go above and beyond to help each other, help your customers, you are well ahead of the game. The other thing the literature tells us is this is sort of a method, if you will, of how do we innovate and how do we move forward? First of all, do you have a system-wide policy of rewards? Do you reward innovation? Or do you say, oh, that's nice. Glad you did that. Yeah, we'll think about that. Do you reward it? Are you purposeful? Do you recognize people who are innovative? And then how do you recognize them or give them appropriate feedback, positive feedback to keep innovating? So what does your reward system look like on a scale of one to 10? You should grade yourself. Secondly, we have to be able to have diverse teams, diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of roles, diversity of skills. We need that diversity because the literature tells us the more diverse the team, the more innovative, creative, and more well-functioning and higher performing the team will be. Third, we have to be able to fail fast and to reward failure. Let me say that again. We have to reward failure. Why would we reward failure? Because failure is about taking a risk. And most of us in our companies are highly risk adverse. And so people are terrified of failing. So what happens when people are afraid of failing? They never stretch. They never take a chance. They're only going to do what's safe. Safe companies are not as innovative as they could be. So how do we create a psychologically safe climate that allows people to fail fast, take a chance, and we reward, recognize, and support them? That's one we really need to work on. Number three, shared decision-making. Is everything come out of the top? Everything come out of the bottom? Or is it shared? We need to think about how do you make decisions in the company and how do you share that information? Autonomy and resources for teams. Do you like teams? Are teams only set up when there's a disaster? Would you ever set up a team just to say, hey, we want to we want to think about a new vision for the future. We're going to set up a team. We're going to call it, you know, uh, Culture 2030. Uh, would you ever do that in your company? If the answer is no, then you got a problem. If the answer is, yeah, we'd probably do that. Well, then you're on your way and that's great. And then we have to set time limits. How, how long are we going to try to improve upon a situation or innovate in a certain way or go through a proof of concept or a pilot? just have to set up a time limit and say, we're going to do it three months, 12 months, nine months, whatever it is, and then we're going to evaluate it. It shouldn't go on forever, but it has to be long enough to make a difference. How could medical service company innovate to greatness? And I just pulled some things from the literature. You're probably doing a lot of these things. This is not designed to say, go do these things at all. I have no, I, I am a neophyte in your business. I understand healthcare and hospitals, but I don't understand your business you do. You're the expert. And so these are just things to stimulate your thinking. What innovations are available in sleep medicine? I mean, at least what I read is, you know, there's a lot of uh, functional MRI, advanced imaging work going on. There's something called dual orexin receptor antagonists. What about genomics and personalized sleep treatments? Could we craft a sleep medicine or a sleep treatment based upon my genetic profile? Nerve stimulators. How do we stimulate muscles and keep airways open for CPAP as an alternative to CPAP machines? Um, cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia. <clears throat> and what about the impact of microbiomes? I mean, how many times are sleep issues related to reflux and that kind of stuff or things that we could potentially fix? Other new innovations, light-based therapies like light boxes or smart bulbs. What about wearables? What about a wearable light device that emits specific wavelengths to promote better sleep-wake cycles? What about um, uh, machine learning algorithms that might teach us about people who are, I'll make it up, age 45 to 55 who have blood pressure of blank and uh, some, other, some other health factor? 
EEG headbands. What about something that we could actually monitor brain waves that was like a sweatband or a headband? And then telemedicine. How do we take all of sleep out of hospitals, clinics, you know, and put it in the home entirely? And then some more what ifs. What if you could, what if we had mattresses that could measure sleep stages? What if there were pillows that tracked respiration and breathing patterns? What if there were blankets that functioned like wearables to record all the information that we need to develop a sleep pattern or sleep treatment for a patient? Why couldn't, uh, why couldn't you do that? Why couldn't you design the blanket for the future or the mattress or the pillow that's a wearable? And then when we think about respiratory, what are the innovations that are available in respiratory care that we could use? Are there things that we could uh, also look at in this area that, that's either in the literature or things that you might be doing already. So we think about personalized precision medicine for asthma or COPD, artificial intelligence in the way we use diagnostics for C CT scans, wearables again. And when we think about wearables, what about stem cell technology or inhaler, inhalers, uh, gene therapy, what, what kind of work could we do in either a collaboration with partners or working on it ourselves? Are there things that we could, you know, do um, to be pioneers in, in, in this field? Smart inhalers, we talked about that a minute, or nanotechnology particles that deliver medications with more precision to diseased lungs. It might reduce the amount of uh, medication and limit the side effects. What about targeted treatments? digital remote pulmonary rehab, the liquid biopsies that we've talked about for five, six, seven, eight years, or 3D printed lung tissue, airway stents, other things that you might get in the business of thinking about for both hospitals, clinics, others. And then, uh, you know, stem cell therapies, gene editing for lung fibrosis and emphysema. There's, there's all sorts of things that we could, we could certainly think about. So I believe that when I look at uh, your annual report and uh, press releases that come out about your company, you have all the ingredients to be even more innovative than you are today. You are an innovative company. You've done great. You have a 75 year history. You've been very successful. You know, Ohio Health is, uh, you know, we're glad that you're, you know, we get to, we are a customer of yours. But the questions you have to answer are more general than that. It's not about could we design the infrastructure to get there? The question is, do you want to? Do you want to be the most innovative company in the United States in this space? Are you willing to pay the price? Because strategy is always about choices. I say that to our people all the time. If you can't tell me what you're not doing, then you probably don't have a strategy. Because if you say, well, we've never not done anything. We do everything that comes up. Anything that's new, man, we chase it. You don't have a strategy then, you are a chaser. You're not doing strategy. So strategy is about choices. It's about choosing to focus time, resources, dollars, uh, and people on these four or five or six things and ignore these other four or five or six things. So if strategy is about choices, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to give up your pet project? Are you willing to give up something you're doing now to do something better? Are you willing to um, ideate in a different way? Are you willing to give up control? Are you willing to let your employees come up with better ideas instead of always holding them at the top? Those are the things we have to answer as, uh, for companies as we move along. And so we can do anything we want. We just have to make sure that we want to do it. And being desire, uh, is much more important sometimes than what's the resources. I always I used to just a story in another company and we had a really smart guy in a health system. He was constantly talking about, he just didn't have the resources to do this. He didn't have the resource to do that. Really the issue was he didn't want to do it because any company that's successful will find the resources to do the right things. The question is what are the right things? With that, I'm uh, actually going to be able to end a little bit early. So it's 1230. So uh, uh, happy to uh, answer questions and I will turn it back over to um, moderator, I guess. John, thank you. Um, really a, an insightful 
presentation. You know, innovation is something that the nearly 2,000 participants that are joining us today um, are either actively involved or you know have uh, see it around them. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, is always a challenge uh, as a person in a business that is around innovation is how do they get involved um, and how do you participate and, and really drive that strategic innovation, even if you're not in a management role. I wonder from your perspective, how do you see uh, effective individuals throughout your organization get involved, even if they don't maybe have that proverbial seat at the table? Great point. Great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always struck by there are seem to be a few people and there's no rhyme or reason in, in my, my, our, my company that are like constantly reading, shipping ideas, <coughs> excuse me, walking into the office with an idea. Then I have other people that <coughs> never do that at all. Right. And so I think it's a thirst for knowledge and you can almost identify, um, people by the way they do it. But the other thing I would say is we have to be lifelong learners, whatever it is, wherever you get your information, we need to be reading. We need to be uh, accumulating more knowledge and thinking about things. Um, and we need to encourage that. We can encourage that in small groups. We can encourage that by, even if you have a meeting, start the meeting with something you just read, uh, you know, in the, you know, on the, you know, out of a, out of a, uh, news, news article or, uh, or literature, stimulate the thinking at the table. And I think, um, you know, that that's always, um, it, it's difficult sometimes to make people feel comfortable and vulnerable in sharing that information. Um, and, you know, if, if I'm a, an active participant thinking about how to contribute, that's, that's really helpful. Maybe looking at it from a managerial standpoint for those that are joining us that are in a supervisor or manager seat, um, what are some active ways that they can really encourage people to speak up? You, yeah. You've really got two different uh, ends of the spectrum that we're trying to uh, support. Great question. One thing we do, um, and we we uh, we make it real informal, but we will go around. Uh, we will build time into a meeting structure. If we have an hour meeting, we'll call it a check in. And we just go around the table and say, hey, we're just checking in, just checking in on you. You know, if you, if you don't have anything, that's fine. But tell me what's going on, even even something personal, what's going on in your life. If you want to share it with people, you know, you you just got a new baby or you're going on a great vacation. But start you can start with a check in where people share just something around the table each and sometimes that will lead to great ideas. But sometimes it opens up the, you know, the uh, the ability to. Um, uh, to start to be able to be comfortable with the dialogue. Think about a faucet. You know, how many times do we sit at a faucet? Man, we'll turn that faucet on and we sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there before it finally gets to hot water. It's the same way with this. We have to keep the faucet on for a while before the hot water will come out. Yeah, I think it, it really does go back to culture. And, and that's a lot of what you're talking about, making sure that culture is met uh, both directions from the organization as well as uh, each indiv the individual person contributing to that culture. So it's, it's a great takeaway. Um, John, pivoting a little bit, um, you know, we, many of our participants are uh, either employees of hospitals or work within hospitals. Um, <clears throat> and the hospitals have historically been that central uh, point to deliver healthcare. Uh, when you think about where innovation and transformation is going, do you see a world where like hospitals are maybe less the uh, the center point of care? And how do you see that really evolving over decades to come? Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, you know, let's face it. A lot of us are dinosaurs, hospital dinosaurs. Right. And uh, just in my company, <clears throat> and I'll bet you if you looked at the places where you work, uh, this was shocking to our board, it was shocking to our people. We went back and looked. 94% of all the patients, we had 4 million patient visits last year, 94% of all the patient encounters that we had at Ohio Health were ambulatory in nature first. See, we think, oh, inpatient, big, we've got these big inpatient hospitals. And they are, they're big inpatient hospitals, but the majority of people 
engage with us in an emergency department, an urgent care facility, a primary care office, a radiology test, a laboratory test, a home sleep medicine, a home care visit, right? They don't engage in the hospital. And yet we've planned our whole mindset around hospital, hospital, hospital. It's the most highly regulated environment. We need to think of ourselves as an ambulatory company that has hospitals, not a hospital company that has ambulatory. It's a really interesting um, kind of paradigm shift there. And I wonder, you know, your your bio, when we, when we read through your bio, you're responsible for so many parts of uh, care delivery. Some of it has to do with kind of clinical execution and some of it has to do with administration and, you know, really throughput in terms of billing and everything else. When you look at innovation um, and, and where it's going, do you see more innovation and investments going towards clinical areas or towards some of the other ancillary components? How do you see those two things going? That is a really good point, a good question. Um, I think we have found if you wanted to stack it up and, and think about where innovation is occurring, we've had more innovation in things like revenue cycle and back office functions than we actually have in the clinical space outside of pharmaceuticals. Now, the pharmaceutical space is the one that's just uh, going to be really innovative in the future. When we think about cell-based therapies, these things are incredible. So uh, right now it's been back office functions, but I think it will flip soon uh, when we think about innovation for the future, especially what I hear from our clinicians is the artificial intelligence application and enablement, what that's going to do is not change, like we still have a CT scan of a, a, you know, if I have a cancer risk, I'm going to get a CT scan or a PET scan. But what's going to change is the ability of artificial intelligence to look at all the data for all the patients in our system and say, okay, well, that's a 55-year-old guy and he has this cancer risk, wonder if all the other 55-year-old guys in our system have the same characteristics. What's his risk profile compared to them? That's what we're not doing today. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I, I think uh, directly applicable to our very small niche industry of delivering home medical equipment, one of the areas that we've not evolved or invested enough in innovation is leveraging the facts. And I wonder... From your seat, you know, we've got um, digital electronic health records that, uh, you know, there's just a few large names that we all know. Um, but in coordinating care, there's still such a reliance on this old technology. Um, what do you see at Ohio Health in terms of uh, eradicating the facts and really getting rid of uh, a paper process? Uh, it, it, is a, uh, it is our number one challenge without getting into too much gory detail we just um, implemented a new lab process and what we did not understand was how customized our processes really were. You know, we still are at the mercy of, you think about it, most hospitals have, there are two major electronic medical record systems in the country, Epic and Cerner. And, you know, in any other environment, you would have 15 of them to choose from, right? And they'd all interrelate and they'd all talk to each other, but that's not where we are. And yes, I think we are still, it's not just relying on paper. It's also think about the person who we have probably 20% of our workforce who is inputting data or extracting data out of systems. That should be automated, right? So we have a lot of people doing a lot of manual work, even if it's not, not on paper, it's still manual work, even putting stuff in different databases. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where we know there's a lot of technology out there that exists and it's really fitting it into the industry that's, you know, hyper-regulated and, you know, so much competition, um, trying to get into a world where um, computers are doing work that computers can do and, and caregivers and uh, employee personnel, personnel can do what you know, they love to do, which is take care of patients and, and deliver great care. And there's definitely a challenge there. Um, maybe just to follow up on some of the uh, limitations to moving innovation forward, uh, I wonder what your perspective is on the continued shift of uh, Medicare and Medicaid replacement plans or Advantage plans yeah. and how that um, can either help or thwart the, the acceleration of innovation. 
Well, clearly, if you look at, um, you know, Dr. Oz has been nominated as well as what the Republican platform is there. I mean, uh, if you want to read a little bit about what's going to happen potentially in healthcare, is go to that Heritage Foundation Project 2025 chapter on healthcare. I think it's chapter 14. Don't quote me on the chapter. The entire uh, Heritage Foundation Project 2025 is 922 pages. You don't want to read all that, but the chapter on healthcare is about 35 pages. Very interesting stuff. Obviously, they want to promote competition. That's sort of a Republican kind of, of format. But the other thing they want to do is they want they want to double down on Medicare Advantage. And in fact, if you look at some of Dr. Oz's campaigning when he was campaigning for senator in Pennsylvania, he wanted to change the name for Medicare Advantage to Medical Advantage, and he wanted it to be Medical Advantage for All. Said another way, not only automatically enroll new people who turn 65 into Medica Medicare Advantage, but also to take those uh, patients who fall between the cracks in Medicaid and put them into a Medicare Advantage-like product. And they want to, they want to payroll, they want to fund that through a, uh, an increased payroll tax. Now, what's my point? Um, Medicare Advantage does give us a little bit of a ability to ideate and innovate because it's a fixed sum, right? You, you get a fixed sum of money for a patient. And that makes it easier than medi uh, traditional Medicare fee-for-service and how we innovate and ideate. Um, the question is, will we be able to work with the Optums and the Humanas and all those companies? Because there'll be about, what, six or seven or eight companies who are very large that we'll have to work with. But clearly, um, if you if you look at what the Republican platform is, it is going to be about Medicare Advantage. There's no question about it. Yeah, and, and not to um, not to get into a political um, discussion, but as you've been in healthcare for um, through many administrations, do you see uh, a hospital system strategy towards innovation and investment? Does it change with what happens in Washington? How dynamic does it change? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, traditionally, the Democratic Party has been better about funding healthcare and, but more in a more highly regulated environment. The Republicans traditionally, historically, have been less regulation, but also less money. Having said that, um, where we think what's going, one of the things we think is going to happen is the antitrust FTC burdens are going to lift. They're going to put somebody in, uh, you know, the attorney general seat and the FTC seats that are not, um, are, are comfortable, I should say, with larger size companies. So we believe that over the next four years, you're going to see much more consolidation of health systems because there won't be as much breakup pressure. So we'll see more consolidation, larger companies, even in the state of Ohio, you could see you have maybe five, six major systems right now. You might get down to three. I don't know. We'd have to see. John, we've seen, um, just talking about the consolidation, um, we've seen attempts at that uh, across the country for, um, I don't know, a decade or two. And, and it feels like the further the um, potential consolidator or consolidatee are from each other geographically, the harder it is to, to really... Um, get the synergy that you're desiring and, and have it as one platform. Do you, again, thinking about innovation and consolidation, right. do you think that that's going to change? I mean, will it matter as much where the system is located in terms of how they would uh, expand? You're asking all the, all the tough questions and the good ones. Uh, our philosophy, and I'm not saying it's right, so I'm just giving you one, one system's philosophy. We have uh, we've basically taken the position that um, integration or consolidation inside the state of Ohio makes a lot of sense for us. The minute you get outside the state, you lose any advantage on the clinical side. You really can't have physicians relating to each other. You have different malpractice laws. You have different regulation, different payment systems. The only thing you then can do um, like Atrium and Advocate Healthcare did this, you know, North Carolina, Chicago, Wisconsin. What the advantage you get is back office function. 
Um, so you can consolidate back office function for a health system. Um, leading, if you were, most systems are at 14 to 16% of revenue is what we call back office function, corporate, if you will, 14 to 16%. The leading companies are at 8% to 9%. We're at 10% right now. We dropped ours from 16 to 10. Um, but, but the reality is once you get, once you extract, let's say 5% of your revenue and back office function, what are you going to do now? And your inflation rights going up two, three, four, five percent. So it is very hard for us to conceive of synergies across state lines for the most part. Well, John, um, you know, your presentation and, and even uh, the extra um, feedback that you provided, it really underscores the fact that, you know, strategy and innovation are critical, but uh, execution and really the reality of how you need to bring everybody along for that ride, like all those things have to fit. And uh, I think it was a, it was a great topic that uh, all of our participants will have found a lot of value. And I wanna thank you for participating as our keynote. And uh, with that, we're going to cycle to a lunch break and um, we will come back here shortly for the next part of the program. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to working with you uh, as a customer in the future. Thanks, John. All right.